Hello. Hi, Francesco. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. It's been a, it's been a, a, a here in Berkeley, it's been a, a week of intergalactic travel. Earlier in the week, we, got, we woke up to, and we felt like we had all landed on planet Mars. Mm -hmm. The next day was the moon. And uh, who knows where we'll be traveling uh, next, but today, <laughs> We're, we're, we're back together here and with Zooming in the weekly curatorial conversations from the Magnus with uh, Shir Galco Javi. Hi, nice to see you again. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Francesco. And Francesco Spagnolo here. The, these uh, these uh, weekly talks are organized by the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life and presented by UC Berkeley's College of Letter and, Letters and Science, the Division of Arts and Humanities. And uh, before we start, just a few ground rules. So welcome everybody. This is a Zoom webinar. It's not a regular Zoom call, which means that all participants video and audio is turned off. So from home, you can see us, but we cannot see you. Uh, you have two ways to reach us from home. Uh, one is using the Zoom chat and please use it for technical issues. But also at the beginning of this chat, you know, um, let us know where you're zooming in from. Uh, let, let us know what, uh, what part of the world you're, you're, you're joining us from. And if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function. Both chat and Q&A are available in specific buttons, typically at the bottom of your screen. So use, use the Q&A uh, function for, uh, for questions. And uh, we will, at the end of the presentation, collect the questions and go through them. And, provide answers, provided we can give answers. We don't answer everything, right? But we, we do, we'll our, do best. our best. Yeah. We'll do our best. <laughs> and uh, so it's uh, good to be here. We've been Zooming in every week for the last couple of weeks. Uh, every week we uh, cover a different topic. Uh, we, we sort of uh, focus specifically on one object from the Magnus Collection of Jewish Art and Life. As a reminder, we're talking about one of the largest Jewish music museum collections in the world thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of objects from all over the world. And this week, our topic uh, and our conversation is led by Shir is Nature in the Song of Songs, an early 20th century carpet from Jerusalem. So we're basically building a whole conversation around the carpet, right? Yes, uh, but you'll see in a minute how extensive a conversation around, surrounding a carpet can be. <laughs> so this carpet was uh, was made in the early 20th century in Jerusalem in a workshop, Marvadia workshop of, at the Betzalel School of Arts and Crafts. So we're going to learn a bit of context too, right? Yes. And, uh, and explore. It's, it's full of details, animals, flowers, plants, uh, and Hebrew text. Hebrew so, text from the Song of Songs. From the Song Chapter of Chapter 2. <laughs> All right. Um, so we hope everybody at home is staying safe. And uh, we're doing our best to, you know, hope we don't have blackouts, uh, meteorites falling. Uh, what I did for this uh, Friday is that I put as a background, instead of one of the galleries of the Magnus, as I always do, I put as a background an amulet. We started this series with amulets, talking about amulets, saying that we really need them these days. And do we need them these days? We'll, we'll take whatever, whatever we can get, right, to, to protect ourselves and others. So let's, let's look at this, uh, at this carpet and at this presentation. We're looking at four topics. Uh, we're first presenting the history of the Bethlehem School, the School of Jewish Art in Ottoman Jerusalem at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, the, the cutoff date was 1906, right? That's when the yes. school started. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at a time frame of about 30 years, 1906, 1936, 38 mm -hmm. or so before uh, the start of World War II. We're focusing, zooming in on artists and art, artisans and especially minority craftswomen and men mm -hmm. who are working at the, at the school. And the sort of the hierarchies between artists and artisans and who was who, whom and where they were coming from, immigrants, but from different parts of the world, some of them less immigrants than others. Um, and then we're looking at the song and even listening some of the song of the land of Israel. Shire Am Israel, like your name Shir, right? Your, yeah. your namesake. Exactly. And then thinking about how all of this uh, production uh, in, in, the, in the School of Arts and Craft was really targeting uh, the souvenir market of the, of the Holy Land, but actually was a, a souvenir market of a, of a utopia. Uh, so 
we'll, we'll talk about Souvenirs from Utopia, which is actually the title of an exhibition that you curated here at the Agnes. And I believe yeah. that on your background there- It are, is on my background. <laughs> so, so you're immersed in your exhibition. I'm immersed and, in the uh, Batilla School. It's an exhibition <laughs> we had to close early when the pandemic hit, but uh, we're almost tired to have to say every time the pandemic hit, et cetera. But uh, we, are, we, are, we, are, we remain hopeful that we'll be able to reopen and share our work in person with uh, with our public, with our with our audience. Yes. So let's keep going. Yeah. A school of so, art. A school of art in Ottoman Jerusalem. Thank you, Francesco. <laughs> the Batilla School of Art, as you said, was established in 1906 by the very um, successful uh, Jewish sculptor Boris Schatz. Boris Schatz was born in 1866 in uh, Lithuania, and and passed away in 1932 during, a, actually in the United States, during a, a trip to raise funds for the Batilla School. Um, this is a picture of Boris in the, I feel very close to that topic, so I, I apologize, but I'm going to talk to mention Boris in his first name. Um, so Boris is here sitting at the entrance to the Batilla uh, School of Arts and Crafts uh, to your left. And Great suit, right, by the way. And yes, I have to say always also that, also that the eyeglasses are pretty cool. I, <laughs> then, I'm, I'm studying but, the beard. I'm, I'm just checking but since, out the beard as well. And since we're also doing some aesthetics today and apparently fashion, you can see him also on the other picture on the right wearing a full on sort of Galabia type, you know, white, very long cape. Oh, that that's was him. very, yeah, that is him. How that very is, Lawrence of Arabia of him, right? Exactly. And that is very, that was his signature look actually uh, at the time and while he was teaching in the school and there are lots of photographs of him from, from the time. So just to say a couple of words about Boris because he's a very important character. Um, Boris Schatz uh, was a successful, became a successful Jewish sculptor. He was invited by the, um, by the Prince of Bulgaria to be one of the founders of the Royal Academy of Arts there. And he had a very successful life uh, as an art, working as an artist in Paris. Uh, he was part of a, a group of very prolific Jewish artists there. And at some point in uh, around the turn of the century, he decided he joined the Zionist movement and he realized that he needs to do something a bit different with his life. He decided to move to Palestine and to establish this uh, school of arts and crafts. Uh, there's a story which we hope is true, um, about a meeting with, uh, with Theodore Herzl in 1903, just a year before Herzl passed away, uh, that kind of pushed further this um, and, fundraise, and helped fundraise for this school in Jerusalem. Um, so uh, so that's, that's more or less um, this you know, kind a, of a, a, An interesting fact on the, you know, uh, he's sitting on the doorstep of, of the school and there is a, a bilingual sign. Yeah. And the sign is bilingual in Hebrew. I'm trying to point on it. Prima mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Baim, I think I can yeah, read yeah, and yeah. guess. And in German, Willkommen. Willkommen. Right? Yes. And uh, a lot of funding for these types of endeavors at the time was coming from German Absolutely. Uh, and we should, communities. Absolutely. Right? We should probably remember that the, that the first um, that the first organization to support uh, the founding of the Batella School actually came from the Berlin Jewish community and they raised a lot of funds there for the school. Uh, later they had a falling out, but we're not going to discuss that today. Mm -hmm. So uh, Boris Schatz uh, started this school. The concept behind it was very much inspired by actually a, a European, a British uh, thinker and writer who was very, very important at, at the turn of the century as well. His name was John Raskin. And he wrote a lot about the return to nature, the, the rehabilitation and the going back to traditional arts and crafts, which was essentially what Boris Schatz tried to create in the arts and crafts uh, that he revived in this school in Jerusalem. Um, something that we have to mention, I think, and I think it's the next slide. We, in 1918, uh, Schatz wrote a book called Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem Rebuilt, Yerushalayim Hobnuya. You see the, the cover page for this book here. And in this book, which he titled Jerusalem Rebuilt a Daydream, I apologize, I didn't mention the full title. Um, it was um, a utopian novel that was, uh, that is a recount or actually a, a futuristic look at, uh, at, at Palestine in, or the land of Israel in uh, 2018. So a hundred years later, uh, which uh, really looks at Israel as a place of, uh, of um, a very uh, open society, very, 
a society that is very that is based on the arts and crafts, uh, where a lot of the economy is based on cooperative work. And in the center of the school in Jerusalem, in the center, my apologies, of that country in Jerusalem is located, of course, the Betzalel Museum and School, uh, where Jewish art is revived. And here you see Boris Schatz sitting on the, on the top, on the roof of the Betzalel School and speaking to Betzalel. Uh, we should probably mention where Betzalel is taken from, if somebody is not sure. Betzalel is the name of the, of the first considered Jewish artist who created the, the tabernacle. He was um, the director of the work in the Book of Exodus, all, all the work that, that culminated in the creation of the tabernacle. And we see him with the, with the menorah, with the seven branch candelabrum be, behind him. Um, and and uh, Boris Schatz is, is the, the name of the author is actually Professor <laughs> Boris Schatz, right? So, so you wanted to make sure that he was a professor, right? So, and here we are, professors and students. Um, like we say in Italy, siamo tutti dottori, we're all doctors here. Yes. We're all absolutely. professors. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So um, as I just mentioned, and I'm glad we can, we have, we're spending a couple of minutes on this, uh, the school was divided into artists and artisans. Um, when we look at the, at the people of the land, which we'll discuss briefly later, we'll see that there were, of course, a, a, huge, a, a large amount of, of Jewish, uh, European, and Russian immigrants coming to, uh, as part of the Zionist movement in hope for it, to start a new life, a new life that includes agriculture and art creation and supporting and reviving this land of Israel, the so-called biblical uh, historic land, um, with, by, by studying at the Bezalel School and becoming a part of the, of the community in Jerusalem. But there are also people who were already living in, uh, in the land of Israel at the time. They were part of the, the Yishuv, the pre-Zionist uh, Jews who were living there. And these, communities included a lot of, there was a, a big Yemenite community there, for example, uh, there were a lot of women, and these people were also part of the, turned into part of the Vitella school. So in order to- Was there to a hierarchy? Uh, yes. Who, who was an, what, were artists more important than artisans or vice versa? Absolutely, good comment, absolutely. Artists were usually more significant and more well known by their individual names, whereas the artisans were only known by the, by the title of the workshop that they belonged to. So there is a very uh, interesting distinction between the group as a whole as part of the workshop versus the individual artist uh, who is going to be successful. And, 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 and let me guess that uh, the, the artists were mostly European immigrants and, yes. uh, and the artisans were not European immigrants. Yes. And maybe, um, let me just another wild guess. I don't know whether I, I'm on target here, but that maybe women were more artisans than artists. Yes, because well, uh, us women at the time, uh, we had to take. We had a lot of responsibilities. We had to take care of the household. We had to take care of the children, and there were certain works that. Uh, were more convenient, let's say, and more appropriate. On the other hand, we can also see the positive aspect of this, uh, despite the challenges that this issue raises, because women were actually invited to work and to get and to be paid for their work in these workshops. So, I mean, there are always those pros, pros and cons that we need to consider when we look at these. So Marvadia workshop, Marvad is a carpet or a tapestry in Hebrew, Ya, uh, the first letters of the name of God. So um, it's a Marvadia, the, the carpet of, for God or of God. Uh, and that was the title of the, of the carpet workshop at Vitello. And here we have two beautiful example of, examples of carpets from our collection. One which we're going to discuss in depth in a few minutes. And another one here to your, to your left, which is the depiction of uh, Rachel's tomb, an archeological and historic site uh, located in Bethlehem. Uh, today and surrounded by the by two candelabras, the seven, the seven branched candelabras, and the word Zion uh, all around it um, in the I center of a six pointed grab star. It again. Oops, I went too far, but here it is. The word yes, Zion they is were all Zion. over. Yes, all over. Zion, Zion, all over. Yes, and yeah. of course, in the background of the candelabra, you see Jerusalem with the Tower of David. Mm -hmm. um, 
from yeah. the right and from the left from yes from every <laughs> always, aspect always all encompassing uh, and, and here he, are some of the workers right some of the artisans right here are some of the artisans and you can see they're all girls all girls and women uh of different ages from a very young age they started having children there from uh, from the age of eight if i'm not mistaken and and so on and you see them on the left with one of their beautiful creations. This is actually a group, part of a group of postcards that has different types of crafts groups. Uh, it's a little photographed, and this was uh, this is, was published in, in Germany, and you see that the text there is in German and Hebrew as well. And then uh, on your right is this group of of women. But it wasn't only women, as I mentioned. There were also uh, there was also a very large Yemenite uh, Jewish community that belonged. It was part of the issue for for many years. And they and Bitzalel and, and Schatz wanted to find work for them. Yemenite men were known uh, for their to excel in certain works and metalwork and carving in carving. And uh, Boris Schatz in, in nine, sorry, nineteen ten actually started a village, uh, the Yemenite village in Ben Shemen, which is an area right outside of Jerusalem that was dedicated uh, to them. Whether that village life was very successful or not uh, is a question uh, for a different talk uh, because that village didn't last for too many years. Uh, but in that village, he actually established a, a silver and uh, gold filigree workshop. And there were also several other workshops. And uh, in the next slide, we'll see an image of on the bottom of, on the bottom right of the uh, of Yemenite boys and men working in the silver workshop. And on the top left, uh, we have a group that are creating, that are working with straw, creating baskets, Basket and chairs, weaving, yeah. yes, etc. So these are the, the examples that we brought to you today. But let's look at the land. Let's uh, the law of the land, right? This is we're here to talk of the land. So and uh, these are this, these images, not the ones. These are before. great. These are all from the Magnus, right? Yes, these are wonderful images that we're very lucky to have in our collection by uh, two very interesting, very different stories uh, of uh, photographers. On the, on the right is uh, Félix Bonfil, who was a French photographer and writer, um, and he did a lot of photography across the Middle East. And this is just to give you kind of an, an idea of how, how rural the land surrounding Jerusalem uh, was at the time. This is from um, mid-late uh, 19th century. And then to your left, you see a, a photo that was taken by Yaakov ben Kalter, who was, um, who was a Jewish um, immigrant from Eastern Europe. Uh, he came to Palestine in 1923 and started working, interestingly, as a designer and a photographer, both with the British Mandate government and with Zionist groups. So he was, he was a very interesting character working with these two groups, sometimes trying to create very different styles in his photographs. But this, again, is a photo of the outskirts of Jerusalem, probably taken around the 1920s or 30s. And you see how, how rural, you see the, the architecture, the, um, of course, the so-called archeological sites and discoveries there, which Boris Schatz, if we think back at his book, uh, written in 1918, actually mentions as uh, the only places that the Jews of Jerusalem supposedly owned at the time in terms of land. They believed that they owned all of these archeological sites, all of these historic Jewish sites, but beyond that, they didn't know that they owned any property. Um, so that is a very interesting uh, concept of how we're looking at this land. That on the one hand, this biblical land, this historic land, the land of Israel, um, you know, and going back to it and reviving our lives. And when we come back to it and revive our lives in Jerusalem, what does it mean? Do we only look at our sacred places? Do we rebuild places? Do we build completely new places? What do we do with it? So this is a great uh, photograph by Yaakov ben Kalter, and I was able to enlarge it to the point that you can see a parallel between the photograph on the top left to this uh, beautiful um, yes, this engraving by uh, Photographic engraving. Yeah, yeah by Zev Raban, yeah. who was one of the teachers at Betelel. And this is part of a series of 10 paintings of him. Uh, of holy places um, around Jerusalem. So of course he has this and there's the Wailing Wall, etc. 
Uh, but let's go back to Rachel's tomb because that's a pretty interesting case story. And here I found this wonderful photograph that I was mentioning to Francesco the other day. I wish I had this photograph from the other side because mm -hmm. then, because you see the tree and the photograph in the right of the photograph, and then you see the same tree on the bottom on the left. Essentially, you wanted the photographer to be, to be positioned somewhere here. Exactly. Uh, that you would have been perfect. You know, you you can't have everything. Have but we, everything can try right? to we can try to imagine. We can try it, to right? imagine. Yeah. This so, is, yeah. So carpet this is, and photograph. Yeah. A photographic this, carpet. <laughs> I wish. Well, today it can probably be made with at least, I can only think, I can at least think of one artist who can make that for us. But this is one of, uh, of these places that for, for years and years, for a couple of, for several centuries, was actually uh, mentioned in different uh, pilgrims and travelers uh, of all religions coming to visit uh, the Holy Land. And this is a very important site. Uh, you know, today there has been more research done over it. And of course, we're looking at differently at its history and its concept, context, but this is a place that is co continuous, that continuously appears in these Batella works. Um, but it's not only the land, which I'm giving you an example of, it's also the people and the culture. So if we think of the people and the culture, there was this oriental uh, thought thinking when looking at the Yemenite people and their dress and their culture, they were actually seen as if they were the natives, uh, the natives of the Middle East. And this, these are two images by Abel Pan, who's of course, they're based on biblical stories. And you see that the, these women, you know, our foremothers are dressed in very typical Yemenite headdresses and, and these big fabrics covering them up. The sense is that Yemenite uh, knowledge material culture and as we will hear also music was was a portal into biblical jewish antiquity yep. right? mm -hmm. and so the the present-day yemenite jews embodied a, a some form of biblical antiquity it was connected in a, it was felt to be more connected in a truer way to the to the land of israel um you you provoke me in finding a musical example this is a new song of the land of israel it's a, it's a zionist song but performed by Bracha Sfira, who was a Yemenite, she was an orphan, an interesting story that we're not going to tell around now, but uh, it, one of the earliest Yemenite Jewish voices in, in Palestine. Interesting enough, she was at the time, and this is a, an original uh, video clip from, I think, the 1930s, uh, she was produced and uh, managed uh, by Nahum Nardi, who was a, an Ashkenazi uh, musician. So in a way, the hierarchies between artists and artisans were replicated outside of the Betzalel school in, in, in the arts in general. Let's just hear like 20 seconds mm -hmm. of Rachatsvira's voice, if I, if I can get to it, because I am uh, playing Here with my mouse. Here. <laughs> So even the new songs were, were sort of had kind of a, a sense of antiquity that was embodied by the voices yeah. and the The, the Reish and the Ein, as I was taught yeah. in school, the, the Reish and the Ein. Um, so we're look, finally getting to our, to our beautiful carpet. And this is really a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, t textile that uh, we're so lucky to have in our collection. And I just wanted to really discuss briefly in two sentences uh, the this uh, the all the the usage of the flora and fauna in this in this work and you have to understand that it was it was based on existing flora and fauna that was found and seen in the land of israel like the palm tree in the center and the and the goats uh the the doves the vines the figs uh you know she, the seven species uh that we also are going to celebrate in a couple of weeks and on the right i Again, from our collection, we have the, these wonderful drawings of uh, flowers of Israel that were kind of on the left, later. Just, to, just not to confuse people at home. Yes. We're talking Sorry. about the left of the screen. The left of the yeah. screen. Um, yeah, yeah, I tend to do that. This was um, an artist who, who, who did drawings of flowers in uh, 1949. 49. 
in Israel, and so it's the flora of of, of Israel. A little I, later, yeah. a little a few a couple of decades after the carpet was made. But but this was already investigated and looked at and thought of at the time of uh, of Schatz and Bezalel. So yeah. this is just an on, ongoing kind of continuation of that exploration of the of nature in in Israel, and of course in the Song of Songs. And what was easy to find inspiration from was exactly as you said, the Song of Song of Songs. So this the, the Song of Song is actually inscribed in the carpet itself, right? Here is yes. the whole quotation. Yes, it's two two phrases from uh, from the Song of Songs. You wanna, do you want to do you want to just read it for us in Hebrew, Shia? I'm yes. going to let you do it as the native Hebrew speaker. I'm not going to speak Hebrew with my Italian accent. Hanitzanim niru ba'aretz et hazamir hegiya v'kol hator nishma ve'artzenu. Hateena chanta pagia v'hagfanim smadar matnu reicham. Kumi lechi lach raiati yafati v'lechi lach u'lechi lach. It's interesting to me that such an elaborate quotation would be in a, in, a, in a carpet that was destined to be sold to tourists, and many of whom probably didn't know how to even read the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew on it. Uh, but so of it's course, really it's also a memory. It's a call to the sound and, uh, and the poetry of the land and the biblical uh, mm -hmm. antiquity and, and so biblical roots of the work that they were trying to do. Uh, we had prepared more uh, audio clips, but I think we should. We should I think we should to to, 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 to really investigate this, this idea of souvenirs because they're not they're souvenirs from the land of Israel, but it's really kind of an imagined land of Israel, it's, right? Yes, it's from this utopia utopian concept of the land of Israel, and here we have this wonderful postcard, again from our very wonderful huge collection that I was able to, to find, which really gives you an idea of what you come to visit when you become a tour, when you're a tourist in Israel in the, the turn, right after the turn of the century, right before World War I, essentially, you come and visit Tiberius, you come and visit Jerusalem, you come and visit, of course, Rachel's tomb on the, on the center button. Um, you come and visit here, the, here the Arab is. villages and you come and see the Druze villages. And this is what, as a tourist, you would visit at the time. And we also added this other wonderful poster, which unfortunately is not from our collection, which really gives you, this luckily has also the English and the Hebrew here, so you can read parts Tours of it yourself. Right? Come and see, <laughs> Come and see Eretz Israel. Um, and here again, surrounding the, the central figure that shows you the map, you have the same, some of the same places that reappear. So you have Kevr Rachel on the, on the right and center, and then on the left you have Herzliya, the Gymnasia Herzliya that was established at the turn of the century. And the image there is actually this, the selling house of the Betzalel school. So in addition to the school itself, they set up this location right outside the old walls of Jerusalem. And this was uh, their workshop and a place for tourists to come in and buy items like that carpet that we just showed you. Um, and I wish it would have been a unique carpet, but I, I actually found an identical one at the Israel Museum collection, which uh, looks slightly different than ours here on the, on the left, uh, but this is almost identical. Um, and again, these were created for the tourist market. Um, they're very interested to to, interesting to research, and it's very interesting to compare some of our collections at the Magnus with the Israel Museum, for example, or the Jewish Museum, or, or other, other places around the world, and to find out that we actually all have these items that sometimes need to be, uh, that sometimes tend to be practically identical. So this is really just to give you a few examples of the type of items we have and the type of market items and for the market. And also books. And this is a, on the right a book from, from Betzalel uh, with engraved uh, uh, embossed silver on the cover and leather cover, but they were competing with other souvenirs from the Holy Land. So on the left also from the Magnus collection we have, uh, there, there were all these pressed flower books so people could visit the Holy Land and come home with a book that had original <laughs> flowers uh, in the pages of, of a book and I'm bring it I'm not sure home. they could do that today. I'm um, not sure they're Probably allowed not. to bring in flowers. Probably not. I, I, I was just reading news, a, a French tourist in Italy was fined some 1500 euros for taking some sand in a bottle from a, from a yeah. beach in Sardinia. So I'm sure that people, yeah, that things are a little yes. different these days. Yes. Well, I so, think that's going to be all for us Wow, well, we also, it was also fashion. <laughs> Don't forget fashion. And, uh, and we could go on and we on, could go and on, on. <laughs> of course. And, and every week we're really opening up uh, new windows and, and, and uh, we're not giving lectures. We're just uh, kind of Having opening conversation. up some, some, some conversations and ideas. We have a few questions before we part and we just have two minutes. 
Wonderful. Let's, before, before Let's take a couple of this. questions. So I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. We come back and we look at the, we look at the, uh, how did the Magnus get the carpet? What's the provenance of these carpets? This is a good question for you. Um, this was a gift. Uh, this was part of a, of a gift, uh, with extensive gift so. actually, of items from Bechtelel by a local collector uh, that put them together for a good number of years. And they, they probably, I'm, I'm guessing by the age of the collector that it, prob it probably was a member of their family and not them themselves who collected some of these items, uh, but they donated an extensive collection of little items uh, to us, luckily. I'm not mentioning names, obviously. We, we, <laughs> we, we, we have another question about what the process for carpet making was. Was it weaving? Was it uh, hand knotting? Uh, it was weaving. It was often weaving. Uh, it was very, very interesting. It's a great question because what Schatz tried to do is to bring from Europe and from different places around the Middle East the teachers and the machines uh, to Jerusalem. So there, it's a very interesting process uh, and it's a very interesting period of time to learn about how he was able to raise funds and to bring teach teachers from Europe for weaving, from Damascus for different silver work. So, it's a, it's a whole other probably lecture in its own right. And um, what does uh, what does the school shop look like now? Uh, it doesn't exist <laughs> it doesn't. anymore. It doesn't. <laughs> this is really a past utopia. <laughs> reality is slightly different. Uh, reality there took a different turn. It was not exactly how how Boris Schatz imagined it in his novel. Yes, uh, actually, the, the, the economy of Israel does not solely rely on the. <laughs> on, on the souvenirs and, no. and, and the it's not work a socialist of artists and country artists. and art is not put in the center <laughs> sadly um, uh, we, we have a question on, on where is the inscription from Isaiah located on the candelabrum that, that we showed it's surrounding the whole candelabrum and you can probably find a better image of it if you look at our Flickr uh, at our Photo Flickr screen. so go to magnus.berkeley.edu and uh, or write an email to magnus at berkeley.edu. And, and we, uh, we also have you. other requests. We, well, somebody wanted to know whether the carpet is on, on display or in storage. We actually don't yeah. see it on display on your, on your background, on yeah. your Zoom background, just by a hair. It would be on the left of your, of your mm -hmm. screen. Uh, but we do see some of the fashion, the Yemenite fashion yeah. at the time uh, there. And also somebody is saying, we're referring to, the to, to our great collection. What's the history of the collection? Can we do a zooming in on that? Uh, well, actually we could. Yeah, and yeah we that's might, a great but, idea. Uh, Thank you. We have a whole schedule for now and we have all kinds of other, all kinds of other questions that are coming in also through, through chat, but please oh. send them through the Q&A uh, because we can't manage too many things at once. You know, we're, we're, we're museum curators. We're not jugglers, although we can try. We can uh, try. Shir, this was so fantastic. Thank you for sharing all of these ideas and your yeah. exhibition with us. And Thank uh, you. We'll be this back next week treat. and we're focusing um, on... Uh, actually, next week we are celebrating Rosh Hashanah. Yeah, the some following less. week. Yeah. Uh, but the following week we'll definitely be back and we'll discuss postcards from our collection. And it's going to be a rather the unique global medium and that once was, right? So global, so global communication connection. So a replacement to Facebook and Twitter and... Uh, I don't know, an Instagram, I suppose, uh, but uh, in a very so different So we take a little scale. break for a week. Rosh Hashanah is coming for those who celebrate, uh, you know, both uh, Shana Tova, Happy and Sweet New Year, and good luck. And good yes, luck to everyone to also who's not celebrating, to all of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, see you very soon, Shir. Thank see you, you soon. so much. And thank you to thank everybody you. from home, to the about 60 people who Zoomed in with us today. So thanks very, very much. Thank you, Shana Tova.